Okay, not always the most comfortable topic, but I am determined to share my guest with you in talking about sexuality and identity in occupational therapy. Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners disrupt the norm by throwing away the rainbow art and being the best you can be when working with older adults. Welcome everyone to the Seniors Flourish podcast. My name is Maddie Chamberlain. I'm an occupational therapist and I like to talk about everything I'm going to do with occupational therapy and specifically working with the older adult. So I am so glad you're here. If this is your first time listening, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today I have the wonderful guest, uh, Devlin New. He's an occupational therapist and we are going to be talking about um, how to address um, identity and sexuality in the older adult. So, you know, this is not my area of expertise and I feel like it's just an area of us to learn together. So God help me if I mess some things up, but I'm okay with that. Are you okay with that, Dev? I am so okay with that because you know what? God help me if I mess some things up too, Mandy. (laughs) Okay. We're in this together. We're in it. (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> we're in it. We're in it. So I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. For for those who don't know me or haven't heard this voice before, my name is Devlin. Um, I am an occupational therapist. I identify as gay, um, gender nonconforming, and my pronouns are preferably they, them, but I won't, you know, be upset if people use he, him as well. Thank you. Thank you for establishing that, honestly, <laughs> because th- those are the things that I think are really hard um, when you're kind of like new or it's not a familiar area for you. So, you know, like kind of establishing that at the beginning is really helpful. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, and you don't, that's, it's, I don't want to say there's ownership on the community to tell always I think everyone everyone should just ask um Mm -hmm. every person Mm -hmm. um but sometimes it does help if if you feel comfortable or empowered to you know share up front because then you you know set the set the bar for how you like to be identified Mm -hmm. and I am she her there you go. I didn't even, I told you I was going to ask and I didn't even ask That's okay. you. See? I'm just, I'm just setting the bar. There I'm you just go. Throwing it out there. I'm throwing it out there. Amen. <laughs> well, so let's just start. I always like to start with kind of like everybody's OT journey. I think probably just because I'm a little nosy. <laughs> I, like to, I like to hear you know, how people kind of find OT and then kind of what they're doing um, in the profession now. So you want to start there? Yeah, so I had one of we there were a lot of influences on how I found OT or I always say that maybe OT found me because it really yeah. it just like happened. I am the first person in my family to go to college. I didn't have a lot of you know leadership from my parents and how to navigate, you know, what you want to do or even the whole process. So, I knew I really liked psychology. That was like my favorite class in high school. I took AP psychology and I really liked teaching mm-hmm. and I volunteered a lot working with people that um have disabilities or special needs and I really, you know, thought I would be a special education teacher, but I just know that um you know, the, the job life there is, is really tough. And I just wanted something a little different and I loved anatomy. So that's how I kind of found OT. I had a, my best friend who was my first travel partner in high school, who I've known since kindergarten, we've literally been together forever. Um, she was going to school for OT and that's kind of what initially sparked my research into what it was. And it just so happened that some of the schools I applied to had that as a major and I switched my major over. And as we talked before, <laughs> I found a, a BSMS program, a two for one deal for my degree. Yes. <laughs> so I, yeah, I went into that accelerated program and then got through that board exam thing. Um, <laughs> thankfully on uh, the first try and embarked uh, on my journey as an OT practitioner in the travel therapy world with my friend Sydney, who kind of really, I guess, in retrospect, started the whole OT thing for me. So go Sydney. Yeah, go (laughs) Sydney. Shout out to her. She's an incredible pediatric therapist. Um, 
but yeah, I've been traveling ever since. I've worked in home health in a couple states and in skilled nursing, and I'm looking to change it up, um, either dive into peds or get into a hospital of sorts for my next journey. I really want something different. So that's mm. my, my OT journey thus far. Wow. <clears throat> you know, I I love psycho. I feel like we might be like have parallel, have a little bit of parallel lives here. See, like I, in high school, I was a big psychology too. And that's what mm-hmm. I got my minor in, in college. And, um, so it's kind of funny. And I got a two for one too. I got it. I went to an integrated master's program as well. See, see, and I have a minor in psychology. <laughs> see, we're meant to be friends. We are meant to be. <laughs> so let's just talk about, so today, like we said, like I said earlier, we're talking about how about addressing identity. We're going to address identity and sexuality working with older adults. Yeah. And um, you were talking about how you identify as gay and um, just your passion for this topic. So how did you – I mean, just because you identify as gay doesn't mean you have to be passionate about LGBTQ. Right. <laughs> yeah. you know, in that whole community. So how did you kind of like dive into that? Um, or where did that passion s- spark? That's honestly, that's a tough question to answer. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. for me, a lot of my passion comes from my experiences growing up. Um, you know, I, we didn't have money and we, didn't live in a great neighborhood and I was surrounded by just like diverse groups of people. And in high school, I had some really awesome classes where we talked about different minority groups. And I always just, I've always been loud and (laughs) proud, you know, of everything. So I, I just found a voice in, in initially just speaking up for others that maybe have little, you know, quieter voices for whatever reason. And then I really came to know my own identity and that's kind of just where that passion turned to from just, you know, general like activism for, for equal rights for others to really focusing on the community that I live in and and wanting to do my part for, you know, people like me. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, I have, you know, friends from all different backgrounds and I've seen struggles of other marginalized groups and, I know how powerful even just using your voice is. So that's kind of, that's kind of where that comes from. And then just as to tie it all together, OTs are just powerhouse advocates um, for the profession because we're so, we're just such a mystery, I think, still in the medical world um, for our patients, for, you know, everything that they need. I think my passion um, just for the community combined with OT advocacy really brought me to where I am today. Oh, wow. That's really, that's really cool. And that's, I think that's powerful because I do agree with the, we, we have that passion to kind of be advocates, you know, and, and, you know, and I, people have heard my kind of story about like, I am, I have a passion for working with older adults because part of that is because I feel like it's a, underserved or under advocated for population many times, Mm -hmm. especially when you have advanced, um, you know, diagnoses and things like that. Um, and so I, and we're uh, supposed to be a holistic client centered profession. Right. And so that enables every part of a person, (laughs) let it be, you know, the ADLs and the occupations they need need to do daily, but how everything else impacts that. And so it's just, it ties in so Ah, just ties in together, don't you think? Yeah, I think it, humans are so complex, and even what may be like minor to you and I is so so important or so impactful in another's life that I think, yeah, I I totally agree. <laughs> well, let's kind of just start out like with talking about like terminology. So sure. I had done um, an older podcast um, talking about. LGBTQ um, plus in the older community with Kelsey Reeves when her experiences was working with, um, she's a huge advocate and also working with um, a support group for um, transgendered individuals. So that's a super interesting topic um, in podcasts as well. So I'll link to that and we kind of go over it, but was we, 
we're talking earlier, Dev and I were talking earlier, you know, some terminology changes, it expands, it evolves, it's fluid. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're going to kind of like go over that briefly again, kind of the terminology. Um, and I'm going to do my best to keep it straight in my mind. <laughs> I know. But um, should we kind of start there? Does that work for you? Yeah. And if, I mean, I know that you you talked about it a lot in a previous podcast, and I actually, shameless plug, just um, almost finished my LGBT 101 on my Instagram page. So they're, they're, they've got a few resources to refer back to, but yeah, let's break down the letters. So I know um, it's still, it's up for debate. It's all personal preference, but the the most inclusive or, or widely used acronym is LGBTQIA+. Um, mm-hmm. So the L stands for lesbian. That is someone, um, you know, it's a term or identity that describes someone who identifies as woman, um, either cis or trans, and we can talk about what those terms mean. Um, okay. And they're primarily physically, sexually, emotionally, spiritually, in all aspects, attracted to um, other women. So... That is that term. G is for gay. So that is not only an umbrella term, you can say, or some people say the gay community, and that represents everybody. Um, Or it is also referring to people who identify as a man, either cis or trans, and is primarily um, attracted to in whatever way to other men. Mm -hmm. B represents bisexual. So this term or identity is uh, someone who is attracted in any way um, to more than one gender. So that could be um, gender nonconforming, like it's not specific to um, their own gender. So T represents transgender. Um, So this is a term or identity that describes an individual whose uh, gender identity is different than the gender assumed at birth. So this could be someone who was born assumed a male and transitions and identifies as and is a female. So that's T. Q is a little tricky. It represents um, two terms. I'll start with one, which is questioning. Mm -hmm. Um, So people who identify as questioning just simply um, are unsure about or exploring their own sexual orientation or gender identity. And Q is also used um, with the term queer, which is a little tricky term. Um, It can be used as an umbrella term to represent the whole community, but there is a uh, derogatory history with with the use of the term. So not everyone is accepting of that term in a positive way. And that's definitely something you should ask um, Mm. the individual before using. Okay. And then I represents intersex. So that's a term for a combination of chromosomes, hormones, uh, sex organs, genitals um, that differ from the male and female binary that we typically view in society. So this person could be born appearing to be female on the outside, but have mostly male typical anatomy on the inside or vice versa. Um Mm -hmm. So that is I. A is uh, for asexual. So that identity is someone who has little to no um, sexual attraction to others and or lack of interest in sexual relationships or behaviors. But that also doesn't mean that people who identify as asexual, um, you know, don't have relationships or don't even have romance in the relationship. It really just refers to um, sexual relationships or behaviors. And then the plus, that is just the all-encompassing inclusivity portion of the acronym. So this could represent terms or people who identify as pansexual or gender fluid, demisexual. There's a lot, um, obviously, that are covered under that plus. So that is, you know, known to be the most inclusive um, acronym as of this date. As of right now. Yes. Um, I'm... I'm always curious, and I don't even know if you know the answer to this. Dun dun dun! Put you on the oh, spot. No. Oh, no. I know, no, it's not meant to be like that. But it's just like, um, you know, so you have, you know, the plus, right? So, because mm-hmm. we want to be inclusive, 
But I always wonder why, why don't they just add, I guess maybe the acronym gets a little long. <laughs> like how come they don't add those, ac- those to the acronym? Do you, you know, know what I mean? I think about this all the time too. I, I think it is simply because of the length and yeah. in a way the plus is inclusive. But if you think about it, so, um, in a way the plus is also not inclusive because, you know, yeah. a, a bunch of other um, identities are bundled up into this plus. Just kind of be like, you're part of the plus. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's not like I, I don't know. I, yeah. But- and that's even with like using queer or gay community that doesn't necessarily represent, you know, all aspects of the community. So it's, it's tough. I don't think that there is a term yet. Maybe that's fully inclusive, but that's a good question. Yeah. Cause I mean, because they, I mean, honestly, in general, like the the acronym, it, it used to be LBGTQ, and then they have included IA, which I, 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 I like that. You know what I mean? Like I think right. it is a good, better representation. But then, like the plus, I don't know. Like, yeah. Just, but I but I mean, how many more letters can you add? That it is a mouthful. Maybe that's what it's about. <laughs> I don't yeah. Know. I mean, <laughs> sometimes I even use. Um, LGBT plus yeah to just to simplify because sometimes even like QIA gets cumbersome to write or type um you know over and over again and I, yeah. of course there's no harm that's meant with you know not including the QIA or writing everything right. out sometimes it's just to like save on some carpal tunnel syndrome you know <laughs> <laughs> little less typing totally agree <laughs> But, but I, yeah, I, it's just something I thought of. I don't know. I, maybe I should have researched that before I did the podcast a little bit more, but it just kind of sprang, sprang in my mind, you know? So, so let's just talk a little bit about like our role in sexuality and then how it kind of pertains to the LB, LGBTQIA plus um, community. Um, because, you know, like I think it's one of those things that, us as OT practitioners, especially if you're not very comfortable with it or you're trying to learn and trying to be inclusive, um, but you're just kind of like, you also don't want to offend anyone and you're trying hard, you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. such a learning curve um, sometimes. And and it's just like, how, what does that look like? Or what is our role in that? I Sexuality is such like a... It's so complex, but it's so core to the being, like to the human being. And I think directly with OT, if we're talking framework, um, you know, we cover sex as an ADL and we have to, I, you know, what makes OT unique is this occupational interview we do where we basically are, are developing a picture of someone's identity, you know, for their, their plan of OT and for the rest of the the healthcare team. So I think right there, when it comes to OTs addressing sexuality, there's, you know, an ADL in the entire evaluation process for us that are all about identity and, and really sexuality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the things that kind of come up or that I've heard, um, um, is like, you know, you know, it, we all know it's an important thing that we need to ad- ask and address, right? Yeah. Um, because it's just part of it. But also, I think people get uncomfortable because they are like, I don't know how, maybe I don't know how to answer some questions. But I think that applies to any community. It doesn't even have to be part of the LGBTQIA um, community. But, you know, it's just sometimes a kind of a, you know, uncomfortable topic. Um do you have any suggestions on if, let's say you're bringing it up like in a new, in, in an evaluation, sure. what would be a really easy way to talk about it or make sure it's being addressed? So I honestly, because each, each human is so dynamic and different, I don't think that there's ever the easiest way, but I think ways that you can incorporate um, a, an open comfortable um, space for for the client is to use neutral terms when you're you're asking them about their home so if you're asking them you know if they have ask them if they have a significant other or a partner rather than Mm -hmm. like um, a husband or a wife or just assume you know they're with the the opposite gender you I always ask people um, 
you know, what their preferred name is, or, you know, if they have any, any, anything extra they would like to be called, um, you know, that's a part of their identity, depending on the person. I sometimes do ask people, how do you identify yourself? And that leaves it really broad so that Mm -hmm. they can, they can, if they choose to, you know, if they were someone like me, that gives them a door to um, give you their full identity. And if, if they're comfortable with it, and if not, you know, some people just answer that how they choose to answer it. I found that sometimes asking pronouns, which we can talk about, um, Two is is sometimes tough, especially for me as as an openly gay practitioner. I've had patients mm-hmm. have uncomfortable responses when I I try to ask them their their pronouns, and then it was just not like a great experience for me because it in a way mm-hmm. outed outed me or let them assume my identity. But um, I usually just try to ask them, you know, how they identify themselves, and I think that op- leaves like a really safe space for them to tell you what they want to tell you in that time. What is your experience of, um, from like a generational standpoint without um, being like ageism, without like, you know, going that route, but like, you know, just from like a generational, um, have you had any, like, if you say, how do you, um, not how do you identify, but like, if you just ask them about that, do, does anybody like, are they put off by that? Are they accepting of that? Um, yeah, from your experience. Um, I haven't had a vast amount of experience, I guess, with, with populations that may apply to, I do, of course, in every interview, um, any evaluation I ask, I use neutral terms, um, Mm -hmm. because that's really important to me. And I've, I have asked people pronouns and I've, I had a patient who, um, ended up identifying themselves as male, but they, they had, you know, their nails painted and, um, other things that may lead others to assume otherwise. And Mm -hmm. I actually asked them if they had pronouns or preferred identity. And I think that that didn't like make them happy. They didn't love that. I asked them because I think that that was me showing them that I saw them as different, which was a learning experience for me. Um, because of course, as like an assumption, sorry. Yeah. Just because like like, like assumption. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, because the the individual had their nails painted, but um, I don't think that, you know, just as I, I mean, I, I get my toes done. I don't really view that as different. And I think in that moment, me asking something extra made him feel different, um, mm. which is mm. something that I, you know, wasn't my intention. I apologize, but it was a really good learning experience for me. I've also asked pronouns and then, you know, people make jokes about it and say they want to be called Mm -hmm. like some funky name or something that really isn't a part of their identity. So sometimes it's tough, uh, also depending on the area you work in and whether, um, you know, that was, that was in a smaller rural town, like you and I talked about beforehand. And, um, so even me bringing some neutral terms into my interviews would throw some people off. It, it really didn't, I don't think it depended on their age because I did have a wide age group, but, um, I just think that it's, for that generation as a whole, generations above us, the the terminology and language has changed so much. It's it's very dynamic. So I think sometimes it just throws them off because it's not something they're used to, you know, hearing or being asked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's great that a lot of these, <clears throat> in addition to like you know us asking about them personally, but like a lot of um, hospital and facility intake forms are definitely more, um, you know, not more gender neutral or, you know, not having that male or female or, you know, or having an Uh, extra box. (laughs) You know, that is such a struggle. And even, you know, it's kind of the same, same playing field as the plus, you know, when you add that other box to then you identify as other or, um, I don't know. I, that's, Uh, that's I can see that. Yeah. That's a little toppy for me. That's a good one. That's a good. So, okay. So being completely honest, I didn't think I was just like, oh, at least they're being more inclusive. But I do see now that you brought it up. Mm-hmm. See, I'm learning something new. It's kind of the same as that plus that I've always kind of like, oh, I don't like the plus. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, too, I mean, that form is asking you mm-hmm. for your identity, right? So your three choices are male, female or other. I, I don't other. You yeah. know, like that's that's not great. Um 
Oh, yeah. You know, it could be something, it could be something like if your, if your identity is not listed above, you know, please provide it in the space. You know, it, it, it at least allows them to not be other, you know, other. Um, but I do agree with you that more places are becoming conscious of at least adding a box or other, or a space for people to, um, you know, say their true identity because this is is it a stepping stone it's a can stepping call, stone can we, That's call, something... can we call it a stepping stone i completely agree with you gosh yeah good perspective hmm. good one Gosh, I know. Those are the things, you know? I mean, like, I think those are, that's why these conversations are so important. Because yeah. I can be completely honest. I never really thought about it that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, no, absolutely. Gosh. And I do think, you know, like, we were talking about, like, you know, the research and how um, you have, there's a lot more information out there for, you know, the LGBTQ plus community specifically the older adults um and i you know i've been i love kind of digging i love digging into the research you know i like oh. to nerd out on that but it, it's both. it's it's super interesting because you really it really tries to give more awareness on person centered care because i think these are sometimes things that you know like I can think of, oh, I can, there's a few stories I can share, but, um, I know of one gentleman that, um, he was probably, probably in his late seventies or eighties and he, um, you know, quote came out as gay, like in his older years. And it's one of those things is I'll never forget when he was talking about it. And it, it was kind of, I remember him saying like, you know, screw this. Like I, I got to live my life kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like I'm 70 some years old and I'm finally going to, um, you know, be me. And like, I remember him talking about how like one freeing that was, yeah. but two, how he always, you know, he had a family, he had kids, but he always said he knew he was gay. And just like, um, he, he always kind of just blamed it on, you know, just saying it was just, the, it was just the generation. Nobody talked about it. You know, I had, uh, you know, had these expectations of being a husband and he loved his wife and like, just kind of talking about it. And it was really interesting for me, um, to, I never really had thought about, like from a generational standpoint, I, you know, and, and per, and me not having experienced that, um, it was such an, an awakening for me, like to kind of give such, give a story and give perspective because I've always been one to like really try be an open person and yeah. trying to learn a lot and trying to, you know, be, um, you know, welcoming and inclusive and, you know, those are the, that's just who I am. But like, Having that story of a gentleman, you know, feeling like he can be himself at, you know, 75 years old is, yeah, I, it was just, it was just a, a new perspective for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think let's do that. your story, it. like what you shared is so important because it, it goes right along with the research. Um, and I know that you're going to link some of the resources you shared with me down below, but there are hugely identified health disparities between heteronorm um, elderly populations and, and aging pop aging populations and between those within the community that are aging. And there is a difference. And I think this is so important for us as OTs to be at the forefront of because we have such a unique approach to to viewing the whole person. And we talk, you know, about sexuality and sex as an ADL and we gather this person's identity and, and how they live their whole life. And I think it's so important for us as OTs to, to take the lead on this and share with the rest of the team members and, you know, include identity, because as you noted, like that being able to come out at that age was so significant for that patient. And it, it did impact his life, how he lived his mm -hmm. life, how he went around about his daily activities. And my lived experience as a young gay man in this generation is, is completely different than those who are aging within the community and are even still coming out to this day. They're, I even, I don't want to say it's more important, but I think it's just so impactful for us to include 
questions about or leave a space for identity with sexuality and gender for the older populations, because this also might be their first chance to to live as themselves or to to come out and be open with with a healthcare professional, which is a very statistically scary environment for those who identify within the LGBTQIA QIA plus community um, of any age group. So Mm -hmm. it's, I just think that we are equipped with all of the skills to, to not only create a safe space for these people, um, but to, you know, navigate a conversation to, to gather their info because we ask, we're just trained to ask different questions. And I think that we could really improve the overall experience, especially of those who are aging and in the ad- older adult populations in regards to, you know, their experiences re- with their sexuality in, in a healthcare setting. I, the research identifies, mm-hmm. um, there was one study from 2014 that I looked into. It was done in Ireland, but it was titled OT Perspectives on Addressing Sexual Concerns of Older Adults um, in Context of Rehab. So kind of right on with what we're talking about. And mm-hmm. The research yeah. wasn't great as in, um, you know, there, it was kind of the outcomes that we would expect, but I really liked how the the article identified barriers to addressing sexuality in OT rehab. So it kind of, it, it came up with three big areas, which I think is very valid. Um, the influence of culture on decisions regarding whether or not to address sexuality. And I think that's really, you know, saying that our own, our own mm-hmm. personal life influences sometimes will be the reason why we don't address these things, which is, you know, that lands on us as the practitioner to, to work through that, um, perceived confidence and competence Mm -hmm. to address our sexuality, which you and I have talked about. Um, and I think I have this conversation with everyone is just not being sure of what to say or how to ask. Um, and then the impact of resources regarding the inclusion or exclusion of sexuality from rehab. So, um, even if the resources are available to either address this with a patient or if it's accepted, you know, where you are, there's, those were the three main barriers to addressing sexuality that they identified in OT rehab specifically. Mm, that's super interesting because I mean, if you have, you know, we have our own yeah. bias in life. <laughs> And, and, you know, trying to like work through some, if you have, uh, you know, maybe like a religious belief or, um, just like you're talking about like the cultural implications, like just even just assuming, cause you live in a s- small rural community that people don't, you know, identify in this yeah. community or, you know what I mean? Like having just like these assumptions or, or your own thoughts and beliefs, um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be still addressing it because it's part of client center care and being holistic. And it's part of the occupation of, yeah, you know, people, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's, it, so it, the, it's interesting that, um, the, they've identified those as the three main, because you can, I mean, you can see that exact thing because people are like, what am I, you know, I'm okay, I'm going to ask. And then I don't even know what to do with it. Like, like what, or where to go or how to, but you know, it's like using some of those models, the plicit model or the, um, oh, now I'm going to have a blank. Oh, no, I'm going to blank. It's like the updated, it's called, it's not called the updated plicit, but it's about like adding more to that, about asking more questions and, you know, don't just like give the information, but also like, you know, revisiting that and making sure that the information is what they need and, you know, kind of going through some of those things. If, if, if that's a super uncomfortable, you know, sexuality, just in general, looking at the plicit model and then the, oh gosh, Deb, I wish I would have looked this up before <laughs> you're on the, the spot. <laughs> oh, I am, but it's, it's like an updated or it's like maybe the implicit revised or something like that. I will put it in the show notes because I will look it up because that is how I roll. But, um, but it's just like making sure that, you know, like it gives yeah. you a framework, especially if it's something that it's not, not comfortable for you. Um, and knowing what the resources are out there or, you know, even just like searching for them afterwards, be like, okay, yeah, like, I, I don't really know. But I was talking <laughs> with, me. um, yeah. uh, a friend about this the other day. They're, they're an OT and they, 
they messaged me and they were saying, you know, I had this patient who identifies as a lesbian and, you know, they were asking tips about like sexual intercourse and sexuality and they had some sort of neurological impairment. Mm -hmm. So their sensation was affected and the OT I was talking to, you know, she's like, I identify as Catholic and I didn't know how to navigate that conversation. And A, I was really happy that Mm -hmm. she came to me Mm -hmm. because, um, that's a hard step for, for anyone to take, especially with this, with this subject. But she, she said, you know, I don't know. Thankfully, like one of the other OTs is, you know, within the community and has experience with like that type of conversation. And, you know, we were able to like switch patients to get her needs met. And I thought that that was really great of her, but even, even taking that an extra step and like you said, saying, you know, I don't know, I can't answer that question today, but let me go home and let me look into this. And tomorrow I'll, you know, we'll work Mm -hmm. together on how we can solve this. I think that what that friend did was great, but I think it's even better for us to take that extra step because a lot of times within healthcare, especially with LGBT plus concerns, the, the weight is put on the patient to talk about these things or to have all of this knowledge. And sometimes we don't. And, and that is the job of the healthcare provider. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a really interesting point. I mean, also, okay. So here, another example is, so in the, like the learning lab, that I have, I was trying to find, um, some alternative positioning for like, after someone was asking about mm-hmm. looking for hip replacement, right. Um, or you know, knee pain or something. So I was kind of trying to find some graphics and trying to find, um, mm-hmm. some handouts to share. Um, and I couldn't, all I could, I mean, I did find some, but it took a lot of digging. Um, yep. but it was all male, female. And I wanted something where I could, it could be like maybe just like a gender neutral, you know, um, kind of body or look, you know what I mean? Kind of looking if there, yeah. what kind of, um, things were out yep. there. And there's not a lot. There's not, I mean, it was hard to find. And I wouldn't even say they're, you know, they're they're pretty good. I'll give. I'll say they're pretty good. But you know what I mean. I feel like there's so much more to be done, and even like having just um, general, you know, general resources that we, you know, we like to print things out and have them yeah. in our pocket because yeah. you never know what you're going to need. But but it's just it's so important, that, like you said, to be able to say like you know what I don't know or I don't have that resource or um, that's something I can help. Yeah, absolutely. Help you find, <laughs> and just kind of being open to that. But I was really hellbent on finding, um, not a male, female partner. And I found, I found both, but yeah, it's, 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 there's still so much, Mm -hmm. so much work to be done in that area. And, um, you know, and as a healthcare provider, like so much for us to learn, um, because there's always, so there's lots of, um, you know, other occupational needs within sometimes in the LGBTQ, um, plus community. Um, um, you know, like, oh, I'm going to, I'm, see, I'm not even going to have, nope. I'm going to have um, terrible dressing. examples, so, you know, like, like the, the get dressing, yeah. that's what I was trying to say. I couldn't think of the right, correct term. Yeah, when so you're I didn't talking wanna, about like, someone it. who is a trans male and may have had mastectomies done or decided not to have that and they have binders. Yes. I, I talked about this with, with Sarah, binders. shameless plug yeah. number two on the OT for life podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> We'll link Thank it. We'll you. link it because um, it's amazing. But yeah, binders, <laughs> like, it's no joke. You can have some really serious health outcomes, like really negative effects of wearing, using mm-hmm. wrong binders. If they're too tight, if people are improvising and using ace wrapping or other things, like, you can seriously harm your anatomy. Um, so uh, sexuality mm-hmm. is so much bigger, you know, than than who you, you spend time with you know, intimately or not, it's, it affects all aspects of health. Even, I know this is a a controversial, controversial subject, um, that I talked about in Sarah's too, but, you know, access to bathrooms for, for people who don't identify within the gender binary, it is a health issue. People have increased rates of UTIs and kidney infections because they don't have access to safe bathrooms for them. So, it's, it really is like to the mm-hmm. core of OT, everything that we are, sexuality is, is, is at the core of it. Um, whether it's just their identity or, um, 
external factors or even just like them being mm-hmm. having a comfortable space or at least one healthcare provider to come to and talk about these things because even that is just so impactful. Well, and that and that also just kind of goes to show um cuz I think sometimes <sighs> people think of it as yeah like purely yeah. sexual do you know what i mean and 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 if you don't if you you know that is obviously a a, a part of it cuz it's we're people and but also like the identity and like the health concerns as well um it's so important that we can have our <laughs> patients feel comfortable yeah. We we can only do so much, right? We can only you know open the conversation or um, you know be um, open to it or kind of you know lead that. You know that's the patient's decision to, to reveal or not reveal or talk about what what they feel comfortable with. But I feel like it's such an important part of us as healthcare practitioners to just kind of like be open and aware of yeah. that it, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than just yeah. sex. You know what I mean? Like it, it can pertain to so many different things that I feel like, um, yeah, you know, you start like looking into the research and, and the LGBTQ plus community has, you know, those barriers, healthcare barriers, but then you add, um, an older adult population and that, and that yeah. just adds like another whole layer. The, it really does. The CDC, um, healthy yeah. people, 2020, they identified sexual orientation and identity as one of the main gaps in current healthcare research. So there, I know you, you looked through stuff before this interview and it, you know, I'm always trying to sift through whatever I can find. And the, the amount of research compared to say a uh, hip replacement or, you know, like something there, it's just, it's so yeah. minuscule compared. I know that there's a, there is research being done and it of course takes time, but um, yeah, just part of the problem is like not having access to, to ways to even teach yourself, you know, or get educated, edu- provide resources for your, mm-hmm. your patients, but it's bigger. It's so much bigger than just like, sex itself i think that that's something that always has to be talked about in in conjunction with sexuality or just when you're talking about people in general because it's an adl but um no uh it affects every aspect of people's lives there is in the cdc study i think they found increased rates or i know they found increased rates of mental health issues um smoking limitations of participation in activities which this wasn't even an ot study um, increased risk of excessive drinking, right. increased r- rates of obesity, diabetes, decreased access to healthcare. Like mm. this affects someone's sexuality and their identity of, you know, who they are as an entire person affects every aspect of their health. And we can make such an impact mm-hmm. on that by just embracing identity and leaving, um, you know, a neutral space for people to to identify themselves and identify their, their sexuality when, and if they feel ready. Mm -hmm. Gosh. Yeah. Oh man. It's, it's such a, it's such an important topic. And I think, cause I think sometimes people, it's funny because, you know, on social media, you, you get everything, <laughs> right? Like as being on social media, you kind of hear everything and you probably have a different perspective because, you know, you um, are a huge advocate for the LGBTQ plus community on like Instagram and things like that. And I think that's so amazing. But I get all sorts of questions and that and actually, to be honest, that has that is one where people be like, I know I need to. I know I want to talk about it, but I feel just so uncomfortable. And I feel like knowledge is power. Like I am ever learning and I am don't have it right now. Like I don't have it correct probably. And, and, and I'm not saying I ever will like, but I feel like I am a person that really finds like learning new things and trying to evolve as a human (laughs) very, it's an important part of me just being who I am. And so, um, I just love, I just love this conversation. So if somebody is like, okay, saying like, all right, I'm ready to kind of like be more inclusive and I'm ready. Like this has really opened my eyes. What would you think would be like the first step? I think if you're, if you just want to learn, um, 
I will, I will send you Mandy yeah. just like a ton of places where I went to learn. And I want to make this clear. Like I, I, I identify as gay and I identify as gender nonconforming, but I by no means know everything. And, and we talked a lot about, I'm, I'm learning so much as I right. go to and, and failing forward. And, um, I, I will give I will give a lot of resources to you that you can link just to get started on going in depth on the terms, what they mean, even just understanding LGBT history and where you know pride and all of this comes from. Um, I think just 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 diving in, use use Google, um, places like the Human Rights Campaign and the Trevor Project and. Um, sage.org, all of those places have just oodles and oodles of resources with basics, um, you know, all the way up. So I think if you're, if you're like, yeah, I just, I want to learn and be open. Um, I think start off with just digging through whatever you can dig through online. Talk to your friends. If you have friends that, you know, identify within the community, just say, Hey, I want to like, I want to hear about your life and your identity. And and what does it mean to you when you go to the doctor's office and you can you have a a place to put the correct identity and you know all of that stuff? I think it's just starting mm-hmm. to have conversations. It's really important to apologize when you say something wrong. You know, be open to being wrong. It's mm-hmm. it's going to be mm-hmm. received. Okay, you'll be all right. <laughs> um, but I think just being okay with being wrong, <laughs> yeah. reading through resources, being very open minded. I you know, I'm always shocked um, when I have conversations, even as a gay man, you know, I go into conversations with certain groups of people with with certain barriers up because of my own experiences. And I yeah. every time I have conversations with people, whether it's from like a small rural town or whatever, I'm, I'm always shocked with how eager people are to learn or open they are to learning. And it, it usually just starts with a conversation. So I always encourage just, you know, talking to people, mm-hmm. you know, or, or just, you know, going online and, and educating yourself. I think that's a good place to start. Educating. Yeah, no, I think that's <laughs> wise you. words. From you got to start with education. <laughs> that's where it all comes from. Knowledge is, is truly power. It is. It is. And, you know, like you were talking about, like, you know, just kind of diving in and having those conversations. So, you know, like, as someone who identifies as a gay man, have you, being a healthcare practitioner, have you had, um, have you had any of those experiences where you felt, um, like from the opposite standpoint, from like a, a, a patient, have you ever had those experiences where maybe, you know, they've had their own oh, bias yeah. towards you, kind of yeah, the flip side, you know, yeah. Um, I, I, yes. Even more so now, um, <laughs> oh, we might hear, let me know if you hear background noise because my roommates just got home. Um, but yeah, I, I think Oh, hey, roommates. I'm not out here to change the world, but I've learned, I have had some less than favorable experiences with, um, some patients, whether they refuse my care because they've assumed my identity um, I've had people say mm-hmm. the nasty names in the books at me, you know, mm-hmm. I understand sometimes with mm-hmm. those patients, first and foremost, as a therapist, regardless of your identity, you are not subject to harassment in the workplace. So if you have a patient that is harassing you in any way, you do not have to treat them. That'll put out as a blanket statement. Um, however, <laughs> Mm-hmm. I know that there's always layers to where that comes from. And if I think I have an opportunity to make a, be the example for someone who maybe has misperceptions of people like me within the community, I will take that opportunity. If it's safe, I had a patient that, um, you know, had some brain mm-hmm. injury and had some complex cancer going on and he would call me the F word mm-hmm. and all of these other words, um, not the not the more common F word we hear, but the one targeted towards, you know, the community. (laughs) And um, it wasn't easy for Uh me, but I knew that a, it was a part of what just happened to his brain. He had a complete personality change and I knew it wasn't personal, but he, he had some, you know, um, aphasia and expressive issues. And those were, that was his only way of like 
being able to express himself and it wasn't personal. So in instances like that, sometimes I, I try to navigate through that care and, you know, see if there's, there's a way I can make an impact. Sometimes it's just been the person who really had malicious intent and, you know, I, they move on to another therapist for the most part, an overwhelming majority, um, have always been accepting. I've had some patients where I've Mm -hmm. been comfortable enough into letting them in to who I am. Um, I don't really love the term coming out. I think it puts pressure on, on all of us. I think if I heard Karamo Brown from Queer Eye talk in an interview about, you know, changing the way we talk about it to, um, us letting other people in instead of coming out, there's no pressure to come out. You know, there's nothing to come out with. It's just letting people into what you already are. I've had patients that, you know, I've had really, really awesome relationships with that. It enhanced our our relationship because I, I was out and open with them. Um, so I've, I've had way more of great stuff than not great stuff, but all of it kind of exists, you know? Yeah. That's a beautiful it's way not, to put it. I mean, like, this I is my that. own personal view, but I think like I, right. I knew from a very young age that I liked um, boys or men. Like I, I knew... I knew young, I really think that this is how I was born. And I think like, if you view it as just letting in, it doesn't even have Mm -hmm. to be about being gay or your gender. I think we all, it's more, it's way more empowering to, to let someone in than be forced to come out and tell other people, you know? Um, So I I just really liked uh, when he said that in an interview and that's kind of how I want to change the dialogue, you know, about, about coming out or revealing your identity to others. I think it's more about letting other people in to, to who you're comfortable being. Oh, I love that. I'm going to start using that. Yeah. Well, not for me personally, but <laughs> like, just, like, I like, I like, the, it, I, but cause language mm-hmm. matters. Language oh. matters. Like I keep it. Like I, I'd say that so many things I can, I'd say that I can tell you a billion examples, not even about like LBGTQ community. Like, it's just like language matters, you know, you know, People you don't have some, you know, dementia patient. It's yeah. a person that has dementia. Like language matters. And it it, it goes across so many different um, communities. And it's just, you know, yeah. it's people first. People first language is very important to me. Um, so I try my best. I may not be, <laughs> be perfect at it, but I just feel like we are all just people that experience this or have this or you know, it is a part of our lives. And, yes. but we're oh my God. For, uh, you need um, to put that on a recording anyway, so uh, I can just play it to the heavens because <laughs> that's, that's it. We're all just people fumbling through life, trying to figure that's it out. It. Like it's not pretty for everyone. <laughs> and I think life would just be so much easier if we all no. just stopped caring about how other people live their lives and just let everyone be who they are. Like, gosh, it sounds so simple mm-hmm. <laughs> in theory, you know? Uh, yeah if, if only i had a, <laughs> i had a patient it was last Link. last week this this is something i mean i had to even catch myself but um they were asking me where i worked before and i said i worked yeah. in a nursing facility and they were like you know you really shouldn't use that term because it's negative just you say it's a, a therapy or a rehabilitation facility don't you know, us older people don't like when you call it a a skilled nursing facility. And I was like, you know, I never thought about that. We always just say sniff or whatever, but I never thought of the impact on that word, you know, for people who have been through it. Um, So Mm -hmm. yeah, language, it is so impactful. It really is. It really is. And, 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 and it is, it can be individualized, right? Like the words, you know, sniff or skilled nursing may not be that some people don't care about that, but, everyone's but I different. think it's just like everyone is a completely different aware. person. So yeah, I think and just being, just being conscious of uh, language can get you so, so many different places uh-huh. in life because if you're conscious of what you say and how you say it to, you know, every person, it, you're going to impact them so differently. I think we just, that's why, you know, you ask mm-hmm. each person their, their identity because it's different. You never know. Gosh. Good one. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love this conversation. Okay. So thank you for sharing your experience and sharing your knowledge and like just thank you for spreading the word me. about. I literally, um, I'm going to be oh honest. Gosh, I course. like did such a happy, like <laughs> oh, no. squealy, oh. jittery dance moment <laughs> when, when this came to fruition. Cause I remember for all of y'all who listen, 
like <laughs> over a year ago because I, I started <laughs> really gearing my online presence towards OT, which had already been interwoven, but like a, over a year ago, maybe like a year and a half now, just before the OT conference. And I remember I messaged you and was like, I'm going to do a uh-huh. podcast with you. No knowledge. I don't know if you remember this. I kind of hope you don't. <laughs> Good. No. Great. Because not a proud moment. <laughs> definitely, definitely, yeah, could have started a relationship with you in other ways. So happy you don't remember. Um, but I just was like <laughs> eager to talk about this. And it was like when I first started. So when you messaged me, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, it's happening. <laughs> the Mandy Chamberlain. I seriously, oh. like, I think... <laughs> You are so incredible for the OT community and the resources you provide have helped me immensely being a new grad and a traveling therapist. I am a member of the online lab. Um, I've used your resources in the past from friends who have the lab. Like, I just think the space that you provide is just amazing for OT in general. The amount of people that see your content and know what OT is and get to talk on this podcast. I'm truly, truly honored to have had the opportunity. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Dev. Such kind words. Oh, you know me. I'm just, I just, I just have a passion for it. So I just really want to empower other OT practitioners out there and students to like, just, oh, be the best you can be. Like it's hard out there. Like make sure you get enough sleep and drink water, (laughs) you know, like, yeah. True. (laughs) Exercise. Get some energy. Do it, do it, do it. Okay, so if anybody wanted to, where do you like to hang out? This is always the question. Yeah, so I hang out the most on on Instagram. I will be very honest. Um, I mean, now with this this campaign, Mm -hmm. I've I've had some more consistency, but I do take, and I'm not ashamed of it. I don't need to explain myself, but (laughs) I do take um, breaks just for my own mental health to focus on on me. Sometimes I need to step away. I am most active on Instagram. I do have a website slash blog that is almost functional. Um, so you can, I'll, there'll be a big post and final celebration when that is, is where I want it to be on my Instagram. I've been talking about it for like a year now. So, but it's live. You can follow the link off of my Instagram okay. and then see my Instagram on the blog right now. That's about it. It's and the it's, rainbow. And what is your handle? Com. Everything What's is like the rainbow bit? OT. Um, yeah, I believe even I have a my Facebook page linked is the Rainbow OT, or it's or Devlin New, you know M S O T R slash L. You can find me though from from everything from Instagram. That's my main hub. So stop in, ask a question, Perfect. educate yourself. You know I'm friendly. Um, yes. I love when I get questions, and you know as we <laughs> talked about before, if you if any of you that are listening have a patient. Um, that you're unsure about if you have questions like i am always a safe space to ask questions um so please share if i don't know i will try to find a resource or another person for you but come on stop by the rainbow ot perfect thank you so much thanks for sharing um and i'm just so glad you were here today so i appreciate it appreciate appreciate dev and i'll talk to you soon and thank you thanks everyone for listening do you feel like you're navigating the ot world without a map not feeling confident or competent in your day-to-day treatments and struggling to apply your knowledge clinically then be sure to check out the seniors flourish learning lab membership it has all the treatment ideas patient handouts clinical resources community support and mentorship you need to succeed join today at seniorsflourish.com slash learning lab.